Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our first panel of the day on Fan of the Future. Uh, so in this session, we'll be looking at um, how the events industry can work better to engage with and excite a, a new generation of fans. Uh, we've got a brilliant panel today, and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, starting with you, Chris. Hi, guys. I'm Chris, uh, one of the co-founders of Strawberries and Cream in the Cambridge Club, and I head up all brand partnerships um, for the organisation. Hello. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Alex. I'm a live music promoter at Live Nation and Metropolis, so I basically route all the tours and um, festival bits here and there. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Walsh. Um, just left a role formerly uh, head of marketing and PR at Festival Republic. Uh, before that, similar roles at Broadwick Live uh, and IMG, where I was looking after uh, Hyde Park Winter Wonderland. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Bennett. I'm Strategy Director at Mustard Media, and we're a festival and a mar event marketing agency. So we work with um, a lot of the major festivals in the UK and Europe, uh, across things like strategy, paid media, and, and campaigns as well. I don't know where to look here. It's very 360, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a different vibe to uh, last year for sure. Um, I'm going to start the uh, the chat with some research that we that we uh, got last last week from um, live. I think it's around 2,000 people were uh, were asked, and it was um, it said 54% were uh, less likely to go out post COVID, and this was rising to 72 among 18 to 24 year olds. Um, and it also said customers are pa customers are pausing before purchasing. 16% of consumers are buying later post lockdown. I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on this. Is this do you think this is a genuine concern? Post-COVID is the trend that you've noticed among the ticket sales, or is there still a, a big appetite for uh, young people purchasing tickets? I think there's still a big appetite. Like We've just come off the back of a really, really busy um, festival launch period in January. And you know, say, this, this is the first year where sales felt like they'd really gone back to normal. Um, but we also work with, uh, we do a lot of like festival tourism and event tourism. Um, and we work with a lot of Ibiza venues and some of the insight they, they were coming back with is that they can see people are spending still on events, but they're spending uh, money on like um, fewer but bigger experiences. So it kind of tells you that people are wanting to do like, you know, your bigger festivals, they're willing to spend more, you know, going all out on things like VIP. But then I guess the question you've got off the back of that is, are people still clubbing as much? Uh, and there was an interesting... Um, stat that I wanted to bring up. So we're working at Motion um, uh, nightclub in Bristol and we wanted to do a campaign where we could think how, how can we engage with young people in the city um, and from this survey with students 92% said they felt like they'd missed out on that rite of passage for clubbing um, and then we've done another survey with um, another major UK festival and they found that over half of the festival attendees hadn't been to the big club brand that they also run, which kind of tells you that young people are clubbing, but it's definitely kind of shifting. And I'm not saying that that's kind of like clubs clubs now dying off. I think there's like still loads of stuff that clubs can do, but it does kind of tell you that tickets are there. You've just kind of got to adapt to the different way that, that people are buying them right now. I think as well, like, yeah, Sean's bang on. And I think the, that two year period is so formative, whether it was 16 to 18, 17 to 19, 18 to 20. I mean, I'm going up in two years. You can you can tell what I'm doing there. But, you know, very important years in terms of learning your way around clubbing and where you sit in the market and what you're into. So I think that's undoubtedly had an effect um, um, that we're seeing now and that 2022 was a, was a, had a lot of issues because of that. But, yeah, it's starting to level out now. It's still, still really healthy signs, but I think there's definitely an element of uh, more of a curated approach to choosing what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, is definitely, we're definitely seeing that a lot more. And yeah, just for a bit of context, um, Chris, do you mind telling us a little bit about your work at Strawberries and Cream and Cambridge Club? You've got some uh, exciting news to share. Is that right? We've got an, we've got an exclusive. <laughs> it's fresh off the news. Well, it's not even off the press yet. I'm actually announcing uh, tomorrow that Strawberries and Cream is going to take a year off um, uh, just because we found that there's, there's been so much fluctuation in the market. Um, we found a lot of data from our audience that it was a lot, most of them were coming up from London, um, which is actually due to the cost of living, it was higher, it was cost costing them more for their experience, getting a train up there than most of them staying over in hotels. Um, and I just think yeah, we're looking at relocating a bit closer to the city. Um, but yeah, that is, is uh, hot off the press coming out tomorrow. Mic drop moments. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's, that's been interesting for us, but also it's, it's, it's giving us a, a longer lead up to the 2024 event. So everything we're doing now is kind of building towards that moment. Um, 
and really trying to create new audiences um, in the city um, and connecting with a new generation of fans um, in, in, in multiple different ways. So, um, yeah, that's coming in, in the form of a number of events and a different social media strategy, uh, which we can go into in a little bit. Um, but, yeah, it's exciting, exciting times. And, yeah, Glastonbury do it every four years, so why, why can't we? <laughs> I've done it for 10 years now. I need a little break. <laughs> And um, how about you, Alex? Do you mind telling us a little bit about your work um, at Metropolis? Obviously, you work on Women Connect and Embrace Nation as well. Do you mind expanding on that a little bit? Um, so I started at Metropolis about five years ago. I was an intern, um, just basically learning the ropes of the live music industry. And then I became a promoter assistant. That's very weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I became an assistant and I did that for about a year and then I became a promoter myself. So I have my own roster and like I said, I, I route tours for different artists coming in and out of the UK. Um, a lot of the work I do at Metropolis is based around like diversity. So we try and focus on like accessibility, um, sexual orientation, gender diversity and that kind of stuff when it comes to like my particular tours. So um, I'll head up like most of that stuff. And off the back of that, we started an employee resource group called Embrace Nation. Um, it focuses on, I guess, the cultural impact of different things within the industry. So it's the place that our Live Nation employees can come to and have a voice and ask questions, questions that they might not be comfortable saying in front of other people or, you know, things that they might feel are stupid, but are not because we all have different cultural backgrounds. We all come from different places. So, you know, everything we know is completely different and we all have different experiences. So that's why we started Embrace Nation because we wanted to just make sure we had a central hub for everyone to just be able to be themselves. Um, and it's been really good so far. Like we've had a lot of workshops. We do um, training every quarter and we have um, different events where we have panelists come in and speak um, about different things in the music industries. But that's what we've been working on so far and hopefully it continues. I saw a lot of great, um, that initiative was brilliant. A lot of my team last year really benefited from it and talked a lot about it. So yeah, you've done a great job there. Thank you. And when it comes to um, engaging with younger fans, what, what sort of channels do you find most effective for you guys? Well, I mean, uh, you know, TikTok is the elephant in the room there. Um, and I'm definitely, Sean will know a lot more, and I'm sure everyone will know a lot more than I do about that. Um, and it is, um, you know, we are seeing yeah, year on year real huge growth on that channel. Um, but in, in interesting ways, it's, it's kind of really mushrooming out from what it's the first started as um, and becoming a much more kind of resource for information and insights um, in a way, which is really interesting, I think. And, you know, there's kind of some entry level quotes that I've grabbed for that as in like, you know, um, young people are using it more than Google for, for searching um, and searching about an event. And actually, I think it's, it's a great platform for, um, for getting under the skin of a brand or a product or a show. Um, and finding out a little bit more about it, maybe getting a bit of behind the scenes style uh, content. Uh, so yeah, without a doubt, it's, a it's the, the sky's the limit with TikTok in terms of how people are using it and utilizing it. So um, you gotta be on there and you gotta be, you know, uh, creating as many different angles uh, and interesting points about your brand as possible. And I think that's the place to, to, to showcase that. I feel like there was quite a big watershed moment for us when we've um, just been running the marketing for a few festival launches in Jan. And one of them being that one of the major UK festivals spent more on TikTok than Instagram for the lineup launch, which is the first time I've seen that happen. It's been a very much like a secondary platform. Um, but I think that kind of tells you... <laughs> I don't think there's ever like a one size fits all approach. Like sometimes TikTok just won't be right for, for an event for many different reasons. Partially it comes down to if you haven't got the resource and the time to really put effort into it, it's kind of no point being on it. Um, but you know, we're working with clients all the time and they kind of push back saying, oh, I don't want to be on TikTok. It's, you know, my audience is too old or we're too cool for TikTok, blah, blah, blah. And every single time I go on TikTok, search for their event and there's just pages and pages of their customers already on there uploading content. You've got wicked content creators on there creating amazing content for them. It's like you just kind of need to, to kind of let the, the shackles off and, and give it a go. But the other thing is that um, there's this guy I follow called Jack Appleby. Uh, he's like a social strategist in the US, but he's worked at like big game and brands, etc. And he put a really good tweet out because he said TikTok, like the, the aggressive growth of TikTok, um, is basically forcing all the other platforms to follow what their uh, you know algorithm is and how they reward content. And it's all about this kind of 
um, you know, get to the point, value driven, entertainment led content. Um, it's more lo-fi, it's caption driven. But because TikTok's driving every other platform to do that, you kind of need to be understanding how to do that content anyway, even if you're not on TikTok. So the chances are you're going to be making reels anyway or YouTube shorts. So if you're doing all of that anyway, my point is you might as well be on TikTok. Like you can't really ignore it. It's kind of the, the effort that you're going to have to put in to understand these new trends that have been so drastic since COVID. I just think it's a no-brainer to, to give it a go. Even if you just write, run some paid ads to begin with, maybe you've not got the resource to do you know, full content strategy every day. Um, but from a paid point of view, not so much with conversions, but from an engagement point of view, it's so much cheaper sometimes when we're running ads on TikTok. I think um, what Sean said there about lo-fi content is absolutely key. And this is maybe the main... Maybe the overarching point I wanted to kind of make today about the fan of the future, maybe I'm peaking too soon, um, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's so important. And actually, you know, we've gone through this kind of gold rush over the last decade of Facebook and Instagram, and, and that's been amazing. It's, it's completely given the event industry, you know, like, like you know, and, and, all, and all digital marketing, you know, as it, it's, it's been the bedrock for it. Um, and, you know, huge glossy productions and amazing, you know, sweeping drone shots and, 10 cameras inside a club, you know, filming eight different angles. And that's all great. There's still a time and a place for that. But in a weird way, that's actually easier content to produce than a, a piece of lo-fi video of someone speaking to camera, talking about their thoughts or their dreams or how they're looking forward to a show as they're walking down a road. And actually, the irony is these days we're seeing bigger pickup on the latter, a thing that took 10 seconds to make and cost nothing as opposed to a 15 grand edit. So actually, you know, this is the... The big challenge is how can you be lo-fi? Can your brand be brave enough to exist in that format and be real, uh, not literally be real, but be real on be real and TikTok um, and, you know, and, and, and be brave enough to be bold and kind of lay your cards out on the table and not just kind of have that kind of glossy sheen on everything. Um, and I think that's really key. That's something you found as well? Is uh, TikTok one of your main, main platforms? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I totally agree that with the um, the high fi content. We used to it was be like our pride and joy making those after movies and spending kind of massive budgets on that. But over the years, that has, has faded away. Um, we've got two completely different audiences for my two festivals. I've got Strawberries and Cream, which is very Gen Z millennial, uh, and then I've got the Cambridge Club, which is kind of historically been 40 plus, um, which are definitely not using TikTok uh, in in the in the capacity that the Gen Zs are. Um, so we have kind of two very different approach for, for, for the marketing on that. Um, I did want to pick up on what I do think is, is these younger um, festival goers are kind of gearing towards, and that's like the, the use of community platforms, uh, the likes of Discord um, uh, and WhatsApp communities as well, which has been a big push this, this, um, this year. And I think there's gonna be an, an upcoming trend in working with kind of your super fans in that space and kind of getting those to create your content in this lo-fi kind of form. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of those kind of those platforms move into that space. And, and a lot of these Gen Z's do feel a lot more confident um, and, a, and, and open to, to kind of sharing their real thoughts and, and, and operating in, in these kind of community led platforms at the moment. Just, just on WhatsApp, I think that's a really good point. We've, um, uh, I guess there's a few different ways you can use WhatsApp. You've got WhatsApp for business, which can be a bit more of a kind of sales customer service channel and then they've just launched whatsapp communities if i'm um, right in saying that where you can i think you can have a few thousand people in that and it's made up of different groups but something we found with our international festivals um you know we've got customer service there we've got emails we've got dms but by launching like a whatsapp holidays team and literally just the reframing of the language making it sound like this instant personal chat you can get access to we've sold loads of um accommodation and flights and trips through that more so than DMs, which we find them a lot of the time, it's like ticket buyers who are already going, they just need to find out, you know, where to go, whatever, or an unusual FAQs. But having, I think there's such a difference, and just ha I think like just the younger generation are so instant, and I know we'll um, we'll come on to the idea of instant gratification in a bit, but like in you just need to like be so instant with them. I don't think they've got the patience to even write a subject line in an email. Like it's like the fact that you can get straight to them in WhatsApp, you can actually sell a lot of tickets through that. Yeah. Yeah, that was my next question, actually. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, instant gratification the other day um, and young people, like the idea of young people having less um, shorter attention spans. How do you kind of work around this then? Oh, God, how long have you got? Um, what I want to do, I've got, I've got a few stats that I want to bring up because there's been a few um, interesting things that some platforms have put out about this. So I just want to set the scene on like where this trend has come from and then kind of bring it back to what events can actually um, think about that and how to apply it. 
Um, so one of the big trends, Jack mentioned it before, is that young people are using TikTok as a search platform now. Uh, and Forbes did a piece to say that Gen, um, Gen Z are using it. 40% uh, of Gen Z are using TikTok over Google. So what that tells you is that the trend is TikTok will tell you an answer so much quicker than if you had to Google something and sift through loads of articles and read loads of text. So people haven't got patience for that kind of search, um, I guess a longer form search function. A second um, really interesting article I read the other day was a guy called Sean uh, Rinald Reynaldo. I think that's how you say his name. Um, and actually the, the title was the ever shrinking dance music track. And he basically did, a, did a, a bit of work to look into, actually I think there was another piece where someone looked into Billboard's top 100 tracks, which is predominantly pop music. And tracks had shortened in length by about a minute um, in, the, in the past kind of like five, 10 years. So he then looked at RA's top, um, top 10 tracks from the past, since about 2012. Um, and traditionally dance music is longer, you know, it's kind of DJ tools, big intros, big uh, outros. And he found that dance music tracks had been um, shortened by about two minutes um, in the past 10 years. But everything's just getting quicker. Like, even if you think of like vocal samples, everything just seems really quick. If you go on YouTube, you'll notice influencers kind of like speed up their voice. They cut out the dead space because people don't really have the kind of patience to, um, to consume things in that way. So what that tells me as a marketer is like, I need to get to the point quickly and I need to be really visual in the way I'm trying to get something across. Even things like your website, like people will not read, like assume no one cares, assume no one will ever read the six pages of beautiful copy that you've spent two days writing before the festival launch up until midnight doing, people will not read it. Like think, how can you be visual in the way you want to get across, can you use photography? After movies is my next biggest bugbear. Um, like two minute chronological move after movies that like start with wristband <laughs> accreditation and it goes from day to night. It's like, it's not a movie. Like you can actually like remix the script of like how you can present information. Like, like look at Netflix series, loads of them now start with like the juicy bit and then they work their way back. So if you're thinking about your marketing, like you've, you're sitting on so much content, think how can it be short form and more impactful and more visual. And then you're going back to, I guess, the trend of lo-fi, which lo-fi really means it's got to be like, value driven, it has hooks. Um, if you think about TikTok, if I ever saw like a polished promo video that wasn't telling me like five ways to do something or 10 reasons you need to do something, my brain's like, tell me what you want me to think about this content because without a caption, I do not, like my brain is norm. I want to get back to cat videos and, and recipes on, um, on reels. But like as a festival, you can think, okay, you know, rather than doing like a sign up video, which we had this with a client, they were like, oh, but we've got loads of like dead polished video. I've spent 10 grand on it, I wanna use it. So I was like, okay, let's like meet in the middle. Why don't you run your little shiny little polished promo video as an ad? Let's get like a lo-fi version of it and let's test it. So the, the polish one was like, sign up now to get access to this and that and this much discount. And then the lo-fi one said, um, when the group chat um, makes, uh, when the Fezzi makes it out of the group chat and now you're living your best life in Croatia, can you guess which one performed better? <laughs> it was night and day. Like we use a metric called stop rate, which is like impressions divided by um, three second video views. And the stop rate on the lo-fi one was like 82%. The stop rate on the Polish promo video was 3%. So it's like, it's in the data. People don't want to watch, watch polished long form content and I think there is a time and a place for that on like YouTube and episodic things and obviously people still binge Netflix so I'm not saying long forms out the window but really like my mantra is I assume no one cares about my marketing I assume no one's gonna give a f about this video and I need to like earn that attention I need to earn that scroll if that makes totally. sense and it's, it's actually very freeing what Sean's describing is a brave new world where you know you can you know up and coming challenger brands can be competing with the biggest brands there is because because the, the the barriers to entry are lower it's all about personality it's all about copy it's all about speed of thought and you know um, advocacy of channels but that's also you know for the established order it's scary as well because you know the uh, the barriers are down so that 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 means that uh, you know that uh, the old way of doing things is not necessarily the right way of doing things. Um, I do think there is still a, t a time and a place for polished video and, you know, for, 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 for capturing your event and your product in the best possible way. But yeah, it's all about that, right. that super short form drive. And even like we're seeing at the moment, the best, for, but the best performing um, adverts on social are ones where you, where you drive to a YouTube video where you've time stamped it. So just before a drop on a boiler room set or for a DJ that you've got playing at your show, 
And it's like, it feels a bit like, sort of like a bit of a tap in. It's like, do people want to see this? But they do, they want to, you want to transport them to that moment and then they connect that moment to your show. And those are the ones that are performing the best. So it's like, yeah, driving people to that exact thing is the, is the, is the is the key as Sean was saying yeah, I agree like we have the same thing with us like we'll measure all the clicks and like see what's um, how many clicks people are actually following through like how many people are opening our emails and when you look at the data stuff that's more relatable like short straight to the point a little bit more relatable is like it's performing way higher than like our long emails and our, like, our mailing list and stuff like that so I mean it's trial and error and it things aren't one size fits all but we're seeing a bit of a change in like consumer trends and how about um, new technologies like uh, Metaverse, VR? Do you think these kind of things are, are crucial for keeping young people engaged in, in the long term? I feel like VR has been around for a while, but I've, I've still not really seen a boot off. Like, I remember putting a headset on years ago, watching, like, a, a gig set, but I've not... It just seems to have stalled. I haven't really seen it come through. I mean, the festivals I... Festivals in general, you are pretty much working on shoestring budgets and performing miracles. So I like in in my sphere, I can't think of a world where that would help me. Yeah, I think it's all about your audience. If you're doing a um, a spectacular production like Dubai, which is all about pushing the limits of event production and experience, and it's five star, seven star, etc., then I think there's definitely you want to be investing in those areas, and it's all about wowing your crowd. But in the UK, I think we're a little bit suspicious of this kind of tech and I think we we thankfully still crave live experiences and live moments um, and that's what you know, that's what we're all here for it's what we're all pushing and selling in some way or other is is the experience and the community of a live experience um, and I think that I think the metaverse and, and you know your, your headsets can are, are two very different things you know um, but if, if your crowd if your market does you know does how does cater for it then I think it's worth exploring um, but yeah, it's a lot of budget to spend on something that I don't really think has a huge amount of um, impact at, at this point in time. I looked into it last year um, with, with a couple of different platforms and it is outrageous budgets. Um, I mean, you would think that because things are getting more expensive, people do want to interact with their artists and see performances more in a, in a virtual space and for a cheaper ticket price. But you know, as you say, like we are craving the live experience and I just do think that the virtual experience hasn't really reached a stage where it's actually something that you really want to do. There was a lot of, lot of it over COVID where people were trying things and, and, and you were getting live, live options, but nothing, nothing really turned me on from that perspective. Um, I know it might be a different story. There's, there's all, you're engaging with communities like kind of Twitch gamers and that sort of thing and, and working with platforms there that have, have got a really organic digital audience that are staying at home. But at, at the moment, I don't think it's worth the inve investment personally. We ran a questionnaire the other day um, for like one of our activations with some young people and they were basically saying they're not interested in it. So <laughs> we were like, okay, maybe we should take a step back. But they were like, we go to festivals because we want to see the lineup, experience the music. We don't go to festivals because we want to do anything virtual reality. So I was like, okay, I hear that. Yeah, sp yeah speaking of uh, yeah, festival lineups, do you think young people are more focused on the big name artists on a lineup poster or is it more about the all-round festival experience? I think it's a bit of both. Like, obviously, the headliners sell the tickets, but I think the, the all-round like festival experience and getting to see multiple um, artists at once is also like a big. Um, it attracts people. Yeah, I think um, uh, one of the biggest shifts we're seeing at the moment is just part, like the concept of partying full stop. But I think that's changing year on year, and you know. People like to say, oh, you know, the Gen Z aren't drinking. And that's not necessarily the case. They're drinking less. I think that's definitely the case. Um, and they're drinking less. And therefore, the, you know, the whole point of being at a festival, being at a show is changing a little bit. And I think um, it's about taking in the experience, drinking it in, enriching yourself. What can the event give me? What, you know, what, uh, what learning is going to take? How can I, you know, and, and, and how can I experience the whole thing as opposed to, you know, being off your face in a field for three days. You know, that's still a part of it, and it's still a big part of it, thankfully, because we don't want that to go, but it's definitely shifting. And, you know, that's they're, they're, I think the, the fan of the future maybe is looking for shows where they can get as much as possible out of it, and that comes from, you know, event curation, um, up-and-coming artists, you know, whatever it might be, uh, talks, panels, you know. Um, it's not just about, uh, yeah, being off your face uh, and, and not, you know, not remembering the whole thing. Uh, so I think the, the focus is shifting year on year. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think a lot of a lot of fans were seeking that last year as well. But I think festivals suffered last year because the cost of everything just went through the roof, and it was very difficult to to put on an experience that people were were really looking for. Um, which has I I think has actually deterred people from going back into that space in the way that they wanted, to, the, the way that we expected. Um, and that's kind of across the board um, in terms of the, like the headliners and and. Um, and artists on, on and smaller artists on the bill. I think it's it's really important to get the diversity, but the, the headliners are still selling tickets, um, in my opinion, it's, and it's important to invest in that. Uh, Warner Music put out a stat, um, which I thought was really telling, and they said that ten years ago, their top five superstars would generate fifteen percent of their revenue from royalties. Today, that number's down to just five. So, I guess what that tells you is there's like less of a concentration on all of the, and this is mostly from streaming stats and royalties, but there's less of a concentration towards um, the kind of mega stars and there's now a more even split across mid-tier artists who haven't quite got like chart busting fan bases, but they've got significant fan bases and there's a lot more of them now. So when you add all of that collectively, I think we're seeing a shift and they've actually come out and said their AR strategy is now, uh, A&R strategy is now shifted because of that and they're invested in lots more middle tier acts rather than, banking on um, finding the next megastar. But it got me thinking, will we see will we see that translate into festival lineups at some point? Because I guess the risk is, you know, not booking a headliner, there's so much money on the show. But if you're kind of going off the data, it feels like, it does feel like that's the way it's going. And also the article mentioned that um, this has actually been a really positive thing for uh, clubs. Because uh, about 10 years ago, they were saying clubs would do about 100 shows a year, whereas now they're doing about 180 shows a year because there's more artists with viable fan bases that you can put shows on for at a, at a kind of reasonable booking fee as well. Yeah, I, I, I sincerely hope that is the case. And actually, you know, this the, headline, the, the, the concept of a headliner is subjective as well. You know, we can, we can book a 500 quid act, head act and put them as headliner. It doesn't mean anything, you know. So it's very subjective. And actually, what it takes for, like, a band or a, or a solo musician to get into that upper echelons is so complex and and takes years or it can take 10 minutes but you know it's it's no exact science so if we start to see a lessening of that requirement of mega headliners doing everything i think that's really good news for the industry because it means more opportunity and you can just be a lot more diverse and brave with your with your programming and uh, how about sustainability i know um jack you worked with Music declares emergency, Reading and Leeds. Um, the music, no, the music on a dead planet was obviously a big uh, campaign you worked on there. How do you kind of integrate uh, sustainability in your marketing messaging? It's tricky because um, you have to be authentic, um, and that is thankfully a lot of companies are great at employing full-time sustainability um, managers whose whole job is to try and permeate the culture of the business and, and get as much green initiatives going as possible. Um, but that's really key. You can. Uh, there's a lot of terrible car crash stories of people wading into try and try and do you know what would you call it um, green baiting or there's a phrase that I can't remember what it is green but um, they uh, green washing that's it um, and yeah it's dangerous but yeah when we partnered with Music Declares Emergency it was great because they are a really authentic brand already in that space um, and that was the first ever headline charity partner for Reading and Leeds which is a big deal and got a lot of caused a lot of heads to turn in the industry which is great um, and yeah they. They were really helpful because they already got a great standing with a lot of artists. So therefore, we could bring artists in. Like Dave was involved, uh, Enter Shikari, um, loads of others. Uh, I can't remember, but there was, there was, there was loads. Uh, and that meant that the the fans could buy in more because they saw that it was more of a 360 thing, and the artists were were, were into it. Um, and yeah, that meant that we had they, they, it was really successful. There was a lot of advocacy for their signups, and we got a lot of Reading and Leeds fans on boarded for this kind of music declares emergency. Um, new wave and, and you know and whether that was signing up or um or you know joining the socials um so yeah it was it was it was successful but yeah we uh, we we partnered with a brand that was already in, um established in that in that space and therefore that gave it the authenticity it needed to uh to to, to succeed how about you chris do you do you notice a difference um in your two festivals obviously two very different demographics when it comes to sustainability in terms of um I think it's a key um, key issue for kind of both audiences. Um, kind of see it in different ways. I, I think the way you did it at Reading and Leeds with the, getting an organisation in is, is is kind of the way to go because as, as organisation our side, it's, it's difficult to to have any sort of authority in, in this space and know what to do and also have the resource to be able to to, to do that. Um, I mean, we did it we, we did it really well with our, our UN Women Safe Spaces project and 
had the idea but went with an with like a, an authority charity charitable charity partner to kind of um, to bring that home and, and make it kind of the 360 experience is needed um, we we, we always kind of look for, for sustainability angles with partnerships, but I think, to be honest, that, that is a really good idea of, of bringing in someone um, to kind of lead the way and, and help, help with the resource on that front, because it is, it is tough and, and, um, and, and budgets, are, budgets are hard. And um, I think it's, the, the fans want to see that and it's, there's definitely a drive for it. Um, but yeah, working with, working with key partners is, is, is the way to go, I think. And I know, Sean, you, uh, you mentioned the idea of mimetic desire the other day. Do you mind like, expanding on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so mimetic desire is a, is a theory that people desire things because other people do. So beyond like food and shelter, we don't really know what we want. So we kind of mimic other people's um, desires. But I think if you could bottle up like one secret to selling out an event or festival, it would be nailing the idea that everyone wants to go to that show. Uh, and again, they're looking into some of the stats around um, Gen Z. They really, really value, um, I guess, other people's opinions and reviews. Um, that piece I mentioned earlier on by Forbes, um, I think it was about 75% of, of uh, Gen Z said they really value um, going on TikTok to find out you know, other people's stamp of approval on things. It's so simple. It's like influencer marketing 101, isn't it? But when you think about your festival or event, all you need to think of is you know, you're probably sitting on a lot of, um, I guess, reviews and this idea of mimetic desire anyway. So I guess step one is, you know, how can you use that more in your marketing? Like really simple, but loads of festivals still don't have like reviews from artists or um, uh, previous customers or press. Uh, one example um, it's actually like a, a, it's a client we're working with called Meadows in the Mountains. It's um, this insane location on the top of a mountain in Bulgaria. So I was doing a bit of research on them and I was on the website and I was like, this actually looks unbelievable. Like there's this picture where it's kind of this little mountain above um, above the clouds. So I was like kind of half sold at that point. Um, gets down to the bottom of the website and I know kind of, you know, using quotes isn't, isn't rocket science, but there was these two quotes that like really hit me in the feels. One of them was from Crack Magazine and they were just saying that Meadows and the Mountains have achieved what every other promoter and UK festival have, have tried to achieve for the past 10 years. And it's like the most pure, genuine version of a festival that they've ever, ever been to. So I was like, whoa. And then I read through the, some of the customer quotes and it was just people saying like, all right, you'll, you'll tell your grandkids about this, but you'll have no photos to show because you would have been having the best time of your life. Um, other people saying they had like really spiritual experiences there. It helped them like get over the loss of a friend. Um, other, another person said they've worked in the festival industry for 25 years and they've never been to a festival like this. And this is me having like worked in festival marketing for, for 10 years. And, you know, you're kind of immune to a lot of the marketing techniques. But I was, I was in my WhatsApp group straight after that going to my mates. And do you know what I did? I used a photo that hooked me in. I screenshotted the crack quote and I screenshotted the... Um, the customer quotes, because really, I'm like the group leader at this point. And what those quotes did was empowered me to convince my mates to come, because that's the hardest battle, isn't it? Especially with um, international events. So yeah, I just think it's a really powerful, um, I guess, mindset to have when you're thinking about how to, to market an event. You sold me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got about, um, yeah, just over five minutes left. Um, I thought I'd just finish with uh, a question on how do you keep audiences engaged year on year? How how do you keep um, people coming back to the same event year on year? What how, you know? What, what's what's the, what's the most important thing in terms of keeping young people engaged and and um, stay, staying interested in, in the same event? I'd actually love. I haven't got enough data to make an informed opinion on it, but I'd love to see data across all festivals and events of how many people go back year on year because um, if we're looking at the data of people wanting to do like more experiences and bigger experiences and maybe one that then leads to different experiences every year it's a question of I had this um, chat with an event the other day and we were talking about like obviously retention is, is something you need to try like you need to focus on it a bit like you need to send emails to last year's customers to try and retain them but we were chatting about how much effort should you actually put into that because you know I actually read another um uh, article about the airline industry. So they actually get mm, the majority of their revenue from loyalty schemes. But then I read another article about um, Colgate. I think it was Colgate or one of the kind of standard um, toothpaste uh, brands. 
and they don't like their whole growth strategy is like market share. So they know that, and like, obviously the nuance is like the type of thing that you're selling, but they know they're not going to get people buying like their toothpaste 10 times a year. But if they can target enough people in the world to buy it once, that that's how they've got like I think it's like twenty five percent of of the whole market, and then and it got me thinking like well where do festivals sit on that like should you spend all of your time and effort trying to convince people to come back or should you like maybe spend ten percent of it but really is it about market share and finding the people you know the new wave who've just turned eighteen who've never been to a festival like is that a better use of of, of budget and effort? I think if you if you if what you do is good if your content's good and your tone of voice is good and you're clearly improving your offering year on year you'll achieve both i think like the whole like right what what do the what do the returning customers want what do the new customers want <laughs> and i've done it before and done whole different campaigns for each one it's like yeah that can be helpful but essentially they should want the same thing and they should want to see the festival looking great um being conversational or being amazing being you know whatever the show is offering if, if it's continuing along that road then it should appeal to both um 100%. I think there's, um, there shouldn't be that much differentiation in the way that you approach returning customers. I think also your customer service has to be on point like, and move with the times because we've had, obviously, over like, the last 10 years, our customer service has changed from like, being on the phone or email. But now, even like, we're respon responding to like, DMs and comments on like, our pictures that we're posting online. So as long as your customer service is on point, I think that also helps with converting people into ticket buyers, but also retaining those customers. Yeah, and I think also um, word of mouth is really important as well. And people sometimes underestimate the like importance of like having multiple touch points throughout the year for your brand. And we have definitely noticed that when we activate again in smaller events throughout, like in in, in the region, then we get a bigger pickup on ticket sales off the back of that. Um, so that, that's a, a case. It, it, it's similar. And, and the re reason why strawberries and cream is has not done as well in Cambridge as I wanted it to is because we're not there anymore, and we're not doing club nights there, and we're not we're not meeting new people and speaking about it there but there's i think there's a, a strategy for us now to do more in our new location on that front and, and generate like the you use the power of word of mouth for sure i was going to say one more thing on that i think there was a tendency in the past for festivals to exist for like half the year or even like three or four months a year you sell out you have the show you do your after movie then you shut up for eight months but i think um i think you know festivals are such a big part of the of the fabric of this country now and and the world and and an event size, it's such a, big, such a big part of everyday life that I think you could start to look at shows as publishers in their own right. And that means commenting on everyday subjects, having an opinion, being informed, you know, being a, a source of, of fun or inspiration or content, whatever it is. Um, it means a lot more work, but I think that, that creates that advocacy year on year, which means that your festival stays relevant and you're not just assuming that people are going to care about what you say after going, you know, after going dormant, um, after going dark for, for six or seven months, you know, they should be a conversation and be a part of the everyday fabric of things in order to stay progressive, I think. Also, I can't um, underestimate the importance of getting back on sales straight after. And it sounds so simple and I don't want to preach to the choir, but some events still aren't doing it. Um, one event we were working with, they sold, by the time they'd launched the lineup for the second year launch, they'd sold more tickets than the whole of last year's campaign. And it was so simple, they just went on sale straight away, did an SMS blast out, give a really good deal. Um, but you know, always be thinking when you're going into your event, I know it's like really busy, it's hectic, but be thinking of like getting a sign up page up during the event, collecting data, trying to get tickets um, back on sale. There's another client that we're, um, the w we're working with and they had tickets on sale during the event. So at the um, all of the merch stands, they had tickets on sale for next year and they sold a thousand tickets during the event. So, yeah, Most annoying have. thing is you be, means you can't have a piss up on the last night. You got to uh, got to be back in bright and early on the Monday. <laughs> maybe maybe wait two days. <laughs> Go on sale on the Tuesday. All right, thank you very much, guys. This is this is flown by. I'm sure we could talk about this for a lot longer, but we, yeah, we've got to wrap up now. So thank you very much. Thanks for thank for, you, for thanks for coming. Thank you, thanks, thanks, Joe. thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone.